Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Imagine Your Story. We're getting started here. Um, on your screen, you should see uh, a slide that has links to today's handouts and our survey uh, for the end of the webinar. I'm also putting those links in the chat box um, throughout the webinar as we have people joining us. And again, at the end of the webinar, I will include those. Whoops. So um, today is brought to you by the Youth Services Advisory Council. Um, you can see on your screen right now, we have a list of our presenters. Um, we will also be recording this webinar and sending it out to you along with the links to the handouts and the survey. Um, if you have to leave early today um, or if you um, are having trouble seeing the screen, I see we have one person who's joined us via phone. Um, a video will be coming your way. So I wanted to get started by introducing our new manuals. We have um, with the Collaborative Summer Library Program and I'm really excited for this new look. If you want, you can talk in the chat box. Let me know how you're enjoying it, if you've had a chance to take a look at it. Um, but just really super excited about um, these new manuals from the Collaborative Summer Library Program. In it, you'll see that there's a summer reading guide. Um, that's the first section. And then we it's followed by the early literacy manual, a Spanish language manual. Um, and then the programming manual is children's, teens, and adults. And on the left side of your screen here, you can see that um, some of the pages and activities will have tabs at the top for children, teens, and adults. Some might just say children and teens. Some might just be teens. Um, on the right side of that page, you'll see inclusion tips, adaptions for the different age groups, and other information. And so throughout the manual, that's basically how it is laid out. And you just have to check the tabs at the top. And of course, everything is adaptable for whatever audience you're, you're serving. Um, use your imagination <laughs> on how you want to adapt things, but I really encourage you to take a look at the new manual. Um, in years past, CSLP um, had to rely on Demco for manual printing and layout, and it was very much stuck <laughs> in the 90s, um, so we're really excited. And you can download these as a PDF um, through uh, our online manual, which I'm going to show you here. So let me get my screen to turn. Um, I'll tell you about that in a minute, but we do have award-winning author um, and, and illustrator, Lewin Fim, doing the posters and artwork for this year. You'll notice that there is a bit.ly there for updated 2020 posters. There was a conflict. Um, Despite many eyes and hands on the artwork throughout um, a two-year process, there was some concern about including Native American symbols in the art. Um, pairing them with fairy tales could be belittling at best. And so it was decided to remove those images, um, but CSLP did not have the time or the finances to put new p artwork up. Um, online in their storefront. So the Library of Michigan is offering you posters that have been edited. Um, the Native American symbols have been removed and you can access them at bit.ly slash LM 2020 CSLP. So please do take a look at that. You can download them with um, bleeds for professional printing at a local professional printer or you can just download them and print them in-house without the bleeds and there's also a tabloid slash flyer feature where you can make smaller additions to do some school outreach with. I'd also like to point out that on the horizon for CSLP are some exciting themes and slogans. Um, we have voted, uh, the state reps across the country decided that Sophie Blackall would really suit the theme oceanography 
better. Um, of course, we all loved her lighthouse book, um, and she's been really working hard on a lot of ocean um, and fish illustrations, and so we decided to switch that. And then Frank Morrison is going to be doing the illustrations for All Together now. I'm going to back it up one slide because I accidentally jumped over my manuals um, slide. And so I mentioned a minute ago that you can download the manuals online. I wanted to be sure to point out that if you haven't received um, your directions on how to access that online manual, uh, do talk to your director. I sent um, emails through our LibPass system directly to all the library directors in Michigan with directions. And I sent a print mailing with directions and the CSLP catalog. Um, all of that went out in October and November. So it's January. If you haven't seen it, talk to your director. If they don't recall it um, and they can't find it in their inbox, please do um, reach out to me and I'll get you those directions. On the left side of the screen, you can see that the full manual program downloads are available. Um, you could also go by chapter by chapter. Um, to get to this, um, you do need a manual code um, through your CSLP account. And I'm asking that each public library access um, request a code, one code per library. So that's why um, directions did go to the directors only. Um, to get you that code. So once you have that code and you access the manual, you can download these. And the new formatting really does make it so easy um, to read on your computer screen. You don't even have to print it out, save some paper, and you can just print out the sections and the reproducibles that you want. Also at the bottom of the screen is the zip collections. I wanted to make sure I pointed that out because I know people um, have trouble downloading all the artwork. Um, it looks like when you first access the screen that it's individual pieces. So if you check the zip collections box, you can download zip files for each of the collections, the age group, the artwork that you want to use um, for 2020. Any questions in the chat box so far? I've not seen any. All right. So. The new store and catalog um, from CSLP, I mentioned a few minutes ago that Demco is no longer with CSLP. Um, they are a vendor. Um, they are serving CSLP with some materials, but CSLP has taken over their own storefront. Um, we have, um, CSLP has its own warehouse and um, everything looks very much the same but maybe a little bit different. We tried really hard um, as state reps to give some feedback so that the, the switch would seem seamless to you all. Um, so feel free to reach out and ask questions. If you're having trouble with your orders, um, do reach out to the information on the CSLP website for um, orders. You can see there's some really fun uh, incentives offered this year, including a puppet. Um, it's the Puss in Boots puppet that was specially made for CSLP. CSLP is really trying hard to move away from a lot of plastic, um, tiny incentives. There are still some available, but they're moving more towards um, materials that will help with your programming. And of course, keeping a lot of the popular things like t-shirts, and bags. I will tell you that t-shirts are um, pretty close to real sizes this year. In the past with Demco, I know a lot of shirts would come in kind of smaller and you'd order up a size, um, but they seem to be pretty standard t-shirts uh, so far this year. If you have any questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat box about these changes of, at CSLP and I'll get to you um, in the chat box today. Before I sign off and, and start this presentation with our Youth Services Advisory Council, I also wanted to let you know about the online resources available through CSLP Reads. That's the handle you'll use on Facebook and Twitter, Twitter uh, as well as Pinterest. And then the hashtags for the summer are Imagine Your Story and Libraries Imagine. 
I also encourage you to use my summer reading so that the Library of Michigan can be sure to catch all your awesome posts on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram. <laughs> all right, so Stephanie, if you want to take it away. Yes, thank you. So my name is Stephanie Wamba and I work at the Braille and Talking Book Library in Lansing, Michigan. And I have two slides for you today. The first thing I want to hit on is just general tips for inclusion. So that's basically what I'll be talking about today. My slides will go pretty quick, um, but you might see me chime in over in the chat box later in the presentation while other people are presenting with just some inclusion ideas as well. So make sure you're looking over there. Um, just general tips for inclusion. Um, the first one there, disability etiquette, ask before you help, don't make assumptions. Um, that one's pretty general. One thing I do like to do with new staff here in the building is to um, have them look through the disability etiquette PDF there that I linked to. That's a great resource for new staff who might be a little um, uneasy maybe um, with what, just how to be inclusive and, and and how to work with people with different disabilities. So definitely take a look at that. Um, I do recommend with any sort of story times or activities, just to make sure you're engaging multiple senses. Um, I give an example on this slide with adding texture or scent to paint. If you're doing some sort of painting craft with kids, you can add um, sand to make the one color paint gritty, or you could do lavender scent in a, a purple paint, just something to give it um, another dimension. When you're promoting your programs, try to use inclusive language. Um, I give a couple examples there, but there are many ways you could word it. Just making sure that on your posters and things that um, you are showing the public that you're open to people with multiple abilities attending and that you're willing to work with people. That's, that's important. Um, just being sure that you're using large fonts. That's one I see a lot um, with, with youth libraries and their programs. A lot of us like to use the really fun, um, fun and colorful text and the, sometimes those can be difficult even for people with good sight to read honestly. So just just make sure you try to use 14 point font or larger on your posters if you have room for it. Um, and then just try to use more normal fonts that maybe don't run into each other, that sort of thing. Um, again, these are just a couple tips. If you had a specific question at all, feel free to email me um, or call me you know, separately and I'm happy to work with you guys on that sort of thing. So these are just a couple of tips I threw together. Um, so, one thing that I like to tell people is you don't have to start with um, start from scratch with doing adaptive programming. And so is what I did here is I typed in Pinterest um, summer reading 2020 and I just saw the first couple of things that came up was um, these create your own story stones. And I thought, oh, that's really cute, but it's not something I could ever use in my programming at the Braille and Talking Book Library because the pictures obviously are just visual. You know, my, the kids in my program, the low vision kids, wouldn't be able to use those. So I got to thinking, okay, if um, another librarian saw this and they thought, okay, I'd really like to do this, but how could I make it more inclusive? How would they do it? So this isn't something I would necessarily use in my summer reading, but if you wanted to use this and make it more inclusive, I was just throwing out a couple of ideas. Um, one thing you could do if you wanted to give it another dimension is maybe out outline the images with puffy paint of some sort, and that would just give it, you know, the tactile feeling. So that could be helpful, even for kids with sight, it's just adding another dimension to those flat images. Um, if I were to use this in any type of setting, I might actually, rather than purchasing the story stones, um, you could buy these on Etsy, but rather than doing that, I would probably um, find image or find actual objects for these. So like the 
the doll, I would bring in a real doll or the dog, I would have a little stuffed animal of a dog, an apple, I'd bring a real apple, that sort of thing. And then you could do the same type of programming with that, but instead you have the actual object. So it's no longer just being able to see the pictures and then create a story by putting them in different orders, but now you have the actual object. So it's, it's a little bit more inclusive, um, tactile, that sort of thing. And you could obviously combine different elements of that as well. So just um, a few ideas there. If anyone has any questions, again, feel free to type them over in the chat box. Thank you, Stephanie. Stephanie also serves um, on the collabor Collaborative Summer Library Program's Inclusive Committee, Inclusion Committee. I can't speak today, apparently. All right, so early literacy. Um, up next, we have Annie. Hi, everybody. I'm Annie Clark the Children's Coordinator at Bay County Library. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about a program I did a couple years ago for toddlers and preschoolers called Mother Goose Games. Um, we basically did it on a Friday morning, which is um, historically when we've done a lot of programs for that age group. Um, the first thing we did was to go around the room and say all the nursery rhymes together to reinforce the rhymes for everyone. A lot of kids and their parents aren't as familiar with nursery rhymes um, so it was a good chance to practice them. Nursery rhymes are a wonderful way to develop early literacy skills. The games that we played, some of them are pictured. Um, we did Jack the Nimble Hurdles. I made candlesticks out of paper towel tubes saved by the maintenance staff and Christmas light Allison die cuts. And the die cuts are taped inside the tube with double stick tape. Um, we also did a Wee Willy Winky Town Tour, which is a pillow sack race. I brought some spare pillowcases from home and the kids hopped from one side of the room to the other. We did Humpty Dumpty's Challenge, which was an egg on a spoon race. We used egg shakers and plastic spoons, again, from one side of the room to the other. We played Jack and Jill basketball. I used um, sand buckets and foam balls. We have um, little stress balls that worked out perfectly. And then we also did Ring Around the Rosie, which is pictured on the left with um, giant traffic cones and rings that kids could toss on there. And then um, Kathy had asked me to talk a little bit about some ways to tie this program in with Every Child Ready to Read. Um, so I have some ideas for different things you could do. If I were to do this again, I would start with a book. Some book choices I thought might be good would be Silly Sally, um, a favorite fairy tale story, one of Jane Cabrera's nursery rhyme picture books. I also like the pop-up book, Lift the Flap Fairy Tales from Pretty Books. Um, it is a very cute pop-up that walks you through numerous um, fairy tales. I thought that you could um, write a list of nursery rhymes or fairy tales that the group knows on the, a whiteboard or chart paper. Um, for playing, you, could, you are going to be acting out the rhymes and practicing your gross motor skills just in this program itself. Um, singing would be practicing the nursery rhymes before doing the activities. Um, it's helpful also to have the words available on a PowerPoint or chart paper, so that would be another way of reading. And then for talking, having the kids retell the nursery rhymes and fairy tales. You could use props like flannel board pieces or puppets to jog their memories. And that was basically my awesome. program. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. Appreciate that. Um, Stephanie also commented in the chat box that it'd be fun to offer wheelchair course, maybe with lighter, wider paths. Um, I want to just point out um, to everybody that the Early Literacy Manual has five chapters and they are the land of littles, the land of heroes, the land of make-believe, the land of mother goose, the land of kings and queens. Um, so lots of ideas there that will fill up your summer um, <laughs> real quickly for any early literacy programming you're looking to do. The, Manual also has these song handouts. Um, they're new. You can download them. Um, they are part of the full zip drive if you download it from uh, the CSLP website. And it's a folder all by itself called the 2020 EL song handouts. So those are already done and made for you and you can just zip them off your, your printer and then families can take it home 
and um, continue to enjoy uh, throughout the rest of the year. And also, I always like to point out the Early Literacy Manual includes a playlist on YouTube. So it's kind of a long link there up on your screen, but if you just go to YouTube and search CSLP Reads, that'll take you to the profile page and then under all their vid um, videos and, and song playlists from pa past years, you'll also see the 2020 CSLP Early Literacy Manual. So that's all available for you and there is a Spanish version. So check that out. Our next slide, whoops, sorry, mouse problems here, is children's. All right, take it away. <laughs> All right, hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, my name is Liz Clowder. I'm a children's librarian or youth librarian at the Bloomfield Township Library. And um, I'm gonna be presenting this information about fairy tale Olympics. Now, um, if you're not ready for summer yet, I am not either. And this is a program I haven't run yet. This is just kind of ideas that are percolating. So um, what you're looking at is my brainstorming process on this slide and, um, and you know, these ideas are not fully fleshed out yet, but it's a good start. So um, we are in a summer Olympic year. So I always kind of look for ideas of what other things are going on in the world that I know my kids are going to be interested in um, during the summertime to kind of incorporate into some programming. And I thought, well, summer Olympics and fairy tales at the same time. So uh, my general thought is this would be kind of a tween age program uh, with several Olympic events incorporating fairy tale stories within them. So, for example, Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, you could have relay races featuring giant's feet, um, featuring jelly beans that they have to balance on a spoon and go from one end to the other. Um, some of the events here might be individual, some might be team-based. Um, you could do a whole bunch of um, either or or just individual things. Um, a lot of different options here. Um, the giant feet uh, relay race option, there's a picture of it over there on the side. That one, I got that idea actually from the manual, the CSLP manual. There's a program in there um, in the children's section called Watch Out for Giants, and there's a lot of other great activities there too. Um, if you didn't want to use big giant feet that you made yourself, you could always use um, two empty shoe boxes with holes cut in the lids and taped shut. You could use um, some adult size slippers, or if you have clown shoes that you just wanted to Velcro on some really weird, you know, fur that you found at the craft store to make them look like giant's feet or something. Um, you could do a lot of different things to make those um, extra fun. Um, and a few more ideas. Um, I just thought about three billy goats um, bridge tennis. So you could just even take a couple of chairs, um, tape some yardsticks on them, and then use a big piece of paper to create something that looks like a like the Billy Goat's Bridge. And the whole idea is that you would use your fly swatters and a balloon to make sure that the balloon um, doesn't touch the ground and that the troll gets it. Um, so that's just another, you know, idea I'm brainstorming. Um, Robin Hood Marshmallow Catapult Archery. Um, so in the CSLP manual, there is another event for night training, um, a whole bunch of program ideas there. And in part of that, they have instructions for making a marshmallow catapult using popsicle sticks, rubber bands, and plastic spoons. So each kid could make their own and that's a great take home item as well. And then take turns, um, you know, shooting their marshmallows at a archery target that you could just make easily out of paper. Um, I also thought maybe there's a little mermaid option, some kind of diving competition using a plastic figurine that you have to drop from a certain height and the kids can all figure out if they, you know, if they have a cup of water or something that the mermaid has to dive into, you know, can they, can they put their cup of water in the right spot on the floor to make sure that the mermaid dives into it. Um, tug of war used to be an Olympic event from 1900 to 1920. So there's an option to maybe make some kind of braid out of old bed sheets um, or just, you know, some cheap tarp or something or even get a long piece of rope and then divide the kids into teams and, um, and do a tug of war event. Um, I also thought of a Peter Pan plank walk, um, playing on the idea of a balance beam for a gymnastics event. Um, 
thinking maybe you'd like get a kiddie pool, put a concrete block on either side and maybe a plank of wood and then just see if the kids can cross it. You could, you know, put some ferocious looking sharks in the kiddie pool or something. <laughs> um, you know, paper sharks are just little, you know, plastic ones you have, to make it look extra scary. Um, it could even be just a time challenge where, you know, who can cross the plank the quickest. And, um, you know, I had some other ideas. I was brainstorming other possibilities. Um, you know, maybe an event, something that has to do with rowing. Um, maybe they make a boat that, you know, they'll have to see who's can float the longest given certain materials or, um, yeah, there's some idea there. There's got to be an idea with Little Red Riding Hood's picnic basket, but I haven't thought of it yet. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of good other stories. You know, there's a lot of traditional fairy tales we know of, but you could base the whole program around untraditional fairy tales or lesser known ones. Um, you could build a program just based on one fairy tale and um, just do a whole bunch of things surrounding that. I know in the manual, there's like a three billy goats, not three billy goats, um, three little pigs and I think it's like a stem building type program so there's a lot of options there too and uh you know you could give prizes to everybody you could give you know track what kids won which events or what teams won certain events and give out prizes that way and have a whole celebration like a medal ceremony at the end like the olympics um but I just linked to some prize options there from oriental trading for medals trophies and bracelets um there's a lot of other good stuff out there but those are just a few Liz, that's, I love the idea of tying it to the Olympics because I almost forgot they were happening this summer. It's in Tokyo, I think, right? I don't know. <laughs> I think it's Tokyo 2020. Wow. Um, so Stephanie included it in the chat box and I just realized chat is awfully quiet and I'm wondering if people know how to find it. So at the bottom um, of your screen, if the toolbar, sometimes it pops up on the top of Zoom, but wherever you're zoom toolbar is under the three dots that say more there is a chat option or you can hit alt h on your computer and chat box should come up so stephanie included that um, she likes that you can have um, a variety of teams and individual games um, so that if kids can't enter um, one thing they can enter another um, so she thinks the variety is really great for inclusion. And Jillian mentioned in the chat box that um, the plank walk is also a great chance to incorporate crocodiles and sharks. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. All right, next, was this Dina? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, hi everybody, I'm Dina Moschek. I'm the children's department head at the Wirt Public Library in Bay City, Michigan. Um, my idea was to do a reader's theater series for Imagine Your Story. The idea came from um, a blog post that I linked on the slide that was forwarded to me by one of my staff members. Um, it's the Dog Man Afternoon link. I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about it, but it's a really cool program and you should definitely take a look at that too. Um, but as we were discussing it, we started imagining other stories that we could use the same model of program. Um, the thing that really stood out to me in the Dogman blog post, which was something I probably wouldn't have thought about on my own, was that it featured Reader's Theater as a centerpiece in addition to other activities and crafts. So I, I learned about Reader's Theater in my children's lit class in grad school, but I've never actually planned a program using it. So um, this is also um, in the planning stages, sort of like as Liz said. But, um, so if, like me, you're relatively new to Reader's Theater, the idea is that it blends elements of reading aloud and putting on a play while letting the kids act out the different parts. So there might be simple props or costumes, but they're not required, and the readers hold onto their scripts, not a book, um, and they don't have to memorize either while they act, act the parts out. So as we were discussing this program, we started coming up with other ideas for stories that would lend themselves well to Reader's Theater. Our hope is to make this program series open to a broad age range and hit on some stories that will be enjoyed by each of those ages. So the three programs in the series that we have planned so far are a dog man program, an elephant and piggy program to reach younger kids, and a fairy tale program with probably Little Red Riding Hood to tie into the theme, um, as well as being pretty familiar to a broad range of ages as well. When I started planning this program, I scanned through the manual for Reader's Theater tips. Um, because it seemed like fairy tales would really lend themselves strongly to Reader's Theater, but I was kind of surprised that I didn't find anything in the manual. Um, I know I've seen things on Reader's Theater in past year's manuals, though, so you can always look through those if you still have them. Um, but some ideas to consider if you 
decide to plan a reader's theater program of your own. Um, there are lots of websites out there with free scripts that you can Google, um, which is what I did while I was planning this, um, planning this slide. But my searching brought up a lot of older websites that don't seem to have as many up-to-date books. Um, the thing I loved about the post that we, or the, the programming that we spun out of the Jayberry post was that it was talking, it was taking Reader's Theater and applying it um, to a really popular book series, which I think will make for a much more successful program that kids will actually want to come to. Um, so what I plan on doing is writing scripts myself. Um, which is easy to do with, with it's pretty easy to do with a picture book, a little more challenging with a chapter book. Um, but the, the post on Jayberry gives um, a, an example, I think, of the chapters that they use. So, um, you know, you can, you can look through your books and figure out what you want to do there. Um, the best stories for Reader's Theater are ones with only a handful of characters and maybe a narrator, too. So we'll be finding an elephant and piggy book with lots of side characters. Little Red Riding Hood obviously has several characters like the wolf and the grandmother and the woodsman and also narrators. Um, those can be scripted out as well for another reader or even be broken into multiple readers if you have lots of kids who would like to read. Um, some of the magic of Reader's Theater is that you don't know who's going to be reading until the program begins. Um, but, uh, like, I, and like I said, you can make simple costumes or props if you want or if they're necessary, but you certainly don't have to. You can just use name tags as well. Um, so th these are the three that we have on our list so far. We may add a couple more so that we can do this every couple of weeks during summer reading. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun and um, it gives us a chance to celebrate some favorite books in the children's room while also um, making the program about reading as well because a lot of times we do party programs and do all kinds of fun activities for a particular book. Um, but I really liked the, the reading element that's built right into it. Dina, um, that reminded me actually the you mentioned that there's no scripts in 2020's manual manual. However, if you find any or if you come up with your own scripts, there is a new aspect with the online manual where you can add um, your ideas. So I'm expecting some more detailed instructions on how you can do that online, but it is already available um, on the online ma manual when you log in. Um, to add your own ideas and things. And so the scripts can certainly be a part of that. Cool. Yeah. All right. We've got fairy tale and fantasy STEM next. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kaylin Christian. I am the head of youth services at the Georgetown Township Public Library um, outside of Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I do a monthly science uh, STEM program, and I've done some of these things in that without the fairy tale element, um, but I was thinking of how to tie that monthly science program into this year's summer reading um, theme and had these ideas. Um, so there is a couple of just well-known um, fairy tales that you could use. So Three Little Pigs, you have two different ways to do this. Um, and I've done it a couple of different ways. If you build, you could have the kids build three houses, one out of like drinking straws, one out of popsicle sticks, and then one out of either Legos or other blocks. And even you could separate those two because the Legos interlock. And so it might even be a little bit sturdier than the blocks, regular blocks that don't interlock. Um, and which house withstands a blast from, I, we've used a hairdryer before um, to see which m building materials are best, but you could use an electric fan, um, you could use anything else that kind of um, generates wind, sorry. Um, the other way that you could do this one is to build, it, put out just a whole bunch of different materials. You could still use straws and popsicle sticks and blocks. You could use newspaper. You could use toilet paper tubes. Um, it, you could use like construction paper and have them build a house out of those self-selected materials and then see who make it a little bit of a challenge a little bit of a competition whose house stands up to a paper fan um who do, and do like a little elimination style who does who stands up to a handheld electric fan and then again a hair dryer or an electric fan something like that 
Um, the Billy Goats Gruff, you could do this with a bridge challenge. This is one that I've done before with this club, not with the Billy Goats Gruff tie-in. Um, but again, offer, and this is my, sorry, side note, favorite thing about a lot of these is that it's cheap with materials that a lot of people already have on hand, um, which is really nice. So you could do this bridge challenge um, using newspaper, tape, string, popsicle sticks, pipe cleaners, glue, all that kind of stuff, and see whose bridge can hold the most weight. Does it hold just one billy goat or does it hold all three? Um, and then you could also, for Rapunzel, I haven't done this one before, but I thought it was really cool that you could design an escape for Rapunzel. Um, and you can either pre-build a tower to make it a little bit more thematic, or you can use like the top of a table or a countertop and see who can reach Rapunzel with the sturdiest contraption for her to escape on. Um, you can make string for like a rope ladder or popsicle sticks, cardboard tubes, blocks, things like that. Um, and then the last one, again, has two options for Jack and the Beanstalk. You can either do an egg drop, um, which I've done with this group before and they have a ton of fun with it. You could, again, provide a bunch of materials, newspaper, tissue paper, pipe cleaners, string, cardboard tubes, bubble wrap, um, if you want to make it a little bit easier popsicle sticks, things like that. And then this was the most important part that I learned is to lay a tarp or two down over a wide surface um, and then using real eggs, see who can deliver Jack's golden egg safely back to earth um, and then increase the height after each round until you get, you know, just a couple of kids that, um, that their egg stays whole. And it does get messy, so you'll wanna make sure that you have paper towel and stuff, but hopefully it all stays on the tarp. Um, I buy the kind of disposable ones, not the really heavy duty tarps, but disposable ones that I can then just gather everything up and toss it away. Um, and then you could also do a parachute challenge with this one, design a parachute um, for Jack to escape the giant. And then again, provide a bunch of different supplies like tissues, newspapers, string, pipe cleaners, things like that. And then test at the end if he uh, if he safely lands or if he um, if it would be a little bit of a hard drop. I love it. Thank you, Kaylin. Um, mm -hmm. In the chat box, I'm just going to recap for those that will be getting the recording. They might not see chat. Um, Liz mentioned she could picture a Rapunzel escape room. And Jillian said maybe breakout of the tower writes itself. <laughs> um, Dina and Stephanie were talking about inclusion with the reader's theater scripts. And um, there are some overlays that helps kids uh, that have dyslexia or are poor readers um, or early readers. Uh, she'll, she's looking for some links. But Dina did mention that um, the Dogman blog post has an activity that includes identifying different scents. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then Sarah mentions that she has kids put their eggs in a Ziploc sandwich bag before they build a parachute um, cover so that there's no mess. <laughs> you could do that in the library then too on bad weather days. <laughs> All right, so next up we're moving on to our teens. And we have Jillian. Hi everybody, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Um, well, teens and tweens are always working with um, everyone else's story. They need some space for their own stories, too. Uh, our, I'm doing slides about developing narrative skills using games. Uh, storytelling and RPG uh, role-playing games, I always jump to the abbreviation, um, have gotten a lot of attention in the forefront the last couple of years, and um, more and more teens are expressing interest in trying them out. They're a great way for kids to express themselves, to create it, their own story, uh, to participate in someone else's story. Um, a good deal of them are aimed at ages like eh, roughly 12 and up, but there are quite a few that are coming out now that are, if not more flexible in terms of age range, at least something that can be adapted. And, uh, oh, I think I neglected to introduce myself. I'm Jillian. I'm a 
youth librarian at um, Muskegon Area District Library. And uh, yeah, so what you want to think about uh, when you uh, look into storytelling or RPG games, of course, look at your, uh, your age group, look at the number of players that are interested. Um, for your lighter systems that don't have a whole lot of rules, uh, those are, tend to be good for kids who are newer to uh, playing RPGs. Um, older kids can usually take on a little bit heavier rule system or more math. Um, a couple of the games that I'm going to mention in the next slide kind of because I had to split it. There's a lot of stuff. Um, a couple of the other games that kind of get a little more intense in terms of their rule systems or have more mathematics involved, you definitely want to reserve those for older kids. But you can start some of the younger kids on systems that, that have a little bit more math to incorporate that as, as, uh, as something you can practice. Incorporate some of those early reading and early learning uh, concepts too, because a lot of these things can also be adapted for younger players. You just have to know which games and know your, your audience best. That being said, four to six players plus a game runner is what you want to stick with. Um, and this talks about some of the benefits and skills. This is a great chance to collaborate with your local library, uh, local library, you should be collaborating with your local library. You're already there. But your local game store would often, like, they'd love to help out with stuff like this. They'd love to collaborate with you. So we're good for the next slide. Um, oh, yeah, but thank you. Um, so storytelling games. These are the ones that you're going to want to aim at younger players, uh, tweens that maybe are a little less used to improvisation. Uh, Rory Story Dice is a great way to get ideas started. Uh, story stones, as we saw earlier in um, today's uh, presentation, um, a storytelling game called The Exquisite Corpse. It's been used as a as an art game where you like everybody draws a piece of an uh, some kind of picture and you fold it over so the previous person, like the previous person's work, is not visible. You can do the same thing with a story. Um, it's the same thing as like the pass the pass the flashlight things that you do when you go camping, where everybody tells a piece of a spooky ghost story, you can adapt that to be a storytelling game. Um, there are quite a few free and and or short uh, RPGs out there that are kind of proliferating right now, and they're very handy if you want to test things out maybe without buying into a whole system or, uh, you know, the full investment. Not all RPGs have a lot of investment. Some do, depending on the system you're looking at. Lasers versus Feelings is a very loose, loosely based on Star Trek. Um, the first iteration of that, and it has a lot of fun zaniness you can play around with. Honey Heist, you are, you are literally heisting honey, and you are a group of bears. There's, there's almost nothing. I can't add to that. It's, it's fantastic. Um, longer RPGs, also some of which have free rules available on their websites, would be uh, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. No Thank You Evil is an award-winning, family-friendly um, adventure game uh, for kids as elementary up to middle school age range target. Uh, D&D is specifically aimed at ages 12 and up. That's Dungeons and Dragons for those of you who are less familiar. Uh, Dungeon World is another very similar structure. The, the, the gameplay mechanics are very different, but the approach to story is similar to Dungeons and Dragons. Fate is a system that's entirely adaptable to just about anything that you want. Um, you can make it into a sci-fi, you can make it into a pirate story, whatever you like. I included Pokemon Tabletop United because it's good to know that, uh, not just that there's Pokemon content, but that's actually a fan-made system. People get very into some of these and will create a system whole cloth, and it's available for free. Uh, Bubblegum Shoe is a, a elementary, well, upper elementary, but more middle school age range um, mystery series. It's a lot of fun. And then I included on here, just in the last couple of days, um, the Gamer Roundtable at the American Library Association just added the last couple of days the Game on Grants. Um, if you follow the link that's included in the slide, and I'll see if I can pull up the, the link so we can include it in chat as well. These are $500 grants for ongoing game programs or for making your own circulating game collection. So these could be very handy for helping support uh, programs like this. There's also um, two uh, uh, important notes about inclusion. There's a really big push right now, and I'm very glad for it, uh, for enabling more disabled players to be able to participate in RPGs. And I've got a couple links to add that, but there are some really great Braille dice resources out there. Uh, a lot of people are working on transcribing some of these systems that maybe the publishers are, are sometimes small scale and don't always have a chance to make 
their stuff is inclusive, there are people who are working on making those things more broadly available to people with different abilities. That's awesome to hear. Thank you, Jillian. All right, Monica. Okay. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Go. Okay. Um, my name is Monica Porter and I was just recently promoted to public services librarian over at the University of Michigan. Um, and so I'm here just to give some ideas, um, summer reading ideas for teens. Um, and I think a great way to do that is through creative expression as well as building a connected learning environment for teens. It's a great way for um, giving teens a voice, telling their personal stories about social identities, finding out what they're passionate about, and for healing as well as self-care. Um, these ideas also are great because it helps them examine and pursue personal passionate interests with each other that leads to academic success, career success, and even civic engagement. So I am one that believes that it's always good to have themed programming when it comes to teens. So I broke it down um, where I have June, July, and August um, having their own um, themes or um, creative expression. Um, so June is known for African American Music Month, but it can be inclusive to all communities. It's just simply Music Month. Um, and a great way to incorporate a program is maybe have like a hip hop poetry slam. Um, this um, is a great connection to community and in in making it fun and as an incentive to teens to participate, um, even offering prizes for the winner, and they can be library related. Um, and then I also have like these um, resources uh, where you use, um, where you have music machi machines creating music using technology apps, and these are all free signups, and it's a great idea for teens to create music and um, expression um, through technology using certain apps. Um, and then we have July. July is, um, can be known as the Technology Month. And by the way, don't forget about the videos for the CLSP Team Video Challenge, and I have provided a link for that. Um, um, because teams can also, um, a part of the Technology Month, create YouTube videos. Um, that's a great way for them to express themselves. And what great way, a greater way to do that than at a library. Um, blogging is a great program because it helps uh, young people journal their feelings or simply just tell their stories that way. Um, web design, being creative with web design and um, a great way to get teens to participate is use the idea of creating their own team space web page um, and making it a contest. And the winner out of the contest, if you don't have a team um, space web uh, page or link, um, would be to reward the team by providing it and having them add that to your library's web page. And there's some resources. There's WordPress.com and Wix.com dot com and Google Web Designer and these are all free signups as well. And then the last um, month, um, which is August, I have um, another idea called like volunteering month, um, giving back and taking leadership. Um, so one program can be can I read to you? And this would involve teens actually reading to K through five um, to kids um, and it teaches them leadership and responsibility and also um, shadowing a library staff. What greater way to uh, diverse, diversify the profession than having a team shadow a library staff member and learn about the library, not just the service desk 
or the reference desk, but behind the scenes, you know, um, you know, building a collection and um, um, technical processing, um, Mailcat, ILL, which, which, which is what the service is called here. Um, then the last one is leading a team book club. That's also another way to develop leadership skills. And also they can involve in adults too to be a part of this and participate. So these are just some great ideas I thought um, I had for teens or to give you um, or as suggestions for teens over the summer. Thank you, Monica. It's important to remember that there's so much going on, all these different themes um, throughout the summer, but I think it's really important to remember that um, there are other things besides Imagine Your Story out there. <laughs> uh, also a, a note, the CSLP Teen Video Challenge will be happening. The page that's currently up is still the 2019 page. Um, and that changed from a few years ago. So instead of, um, doing videos in, during the school year and then submitting them and then having them be kind of like an ad for summer reading. Instead, um, they're challenging teens to create a 60 second or less video in the library that summer. Um, and they um, collect the challenges through the summer. So I'll have information on that challenge coming up for you all very soon. Um, well, when I say soon, I mean probably April. <laughs> um, so, uh, Lindsay, you're next. Hi, everybody. My name is Lindsay Goichai. I'm an information services librarian at the Novi Public Library. Um, some of my programs are geared towards the tween and teen ages, and they do focus on the theme this year. So so one of the first ones that I'm going to talk about is um, obviously everybody is on the trend with the escape rooms. So the Harry Potter escape room is a great program that can be used for tweens and or teens. Um, escape rooms are just great in general because they promote teamwork and problem solving skills um, as they work together to try to either solve puzzles puzzles or escape the room. Um, the layout can be um, done in many different ways. Um, you can divide the guests into groups of 10. You can do smaller groups. You can do a little bit of larger groups. It basically depends on how you want to run your program. Um, we've provided about 40 minutes for one of our escape rooms to solve puzzles and uncover the clues. Um, we also have staff available to give hints as necessary throughout um, that program as well. And let me go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, my next one is a fable, folk, and fairy tales feast. As you all know, um, teens really enjoy programs with food. So I thought it'd be a great program. Um, again, this can be used for tweens and or teens. Um, I have a brief description in there on the second line where it says, get ready to cook up a royal feast. We will make yummy fairy tale themed recipes to create our own magical menu. Um, a couple of the recipes that fit in with the theme are listed on the screen as well. Um, some of those could be, I did a lot of them based off of Disney related themes in the movies, um, is good morning, granola parfaits or porridge. Um, it was a list of some of the ingredients there, magic carpet roll-ups, and sweet sea smoothies. Um, so there's a wide variety, and you can make these for um, all different kind of recipes and come up with your own different names that teens may enjoy as well. And um, my next one is, of course, um, the tweens absolutely love Rick Riordan stuff still, and they still ask for all the books and trivia is really popular at my library especially among the tweens and teens um, so this is a great program um, a lot of the kids have already read these books but if not you can encourage them to read an entire series or you could read book one from each of his series and have a list so that the guests know what the trivia is going to be uh, the questions will be coming from and for the layout, you can divide the guests into small teams. Again, that can change and be less or more depending on your own program. You'll ask the question and then give them a certain length of time to answer. 30 seconds has usually worked well for us. You can tally up points for teams as questions are answered. Um, these kids usually like to receive certificates of participation. Um, you can have prizes, um, various things that you can give away um, for participation and a great way to connect reading um, in the summer as well. And lastly, 
my last slide, is a library con. You can make this as small or big as possible. You can also incorporate um, teens and adult program into one, where you can have staff and guests dress up as anime characters. Um, you can bring in panels or author visits. You can have um, crafts relating to Japanese anime. You can have a book or DVD display, and you can also partner with local um, anime bookstores um, for giveaways or for them to just come and sponsor your program. So there's a lot of different options for tween teens that relate to the theme this summer. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, we had a question in the chat about um, your escape room rules. Do you purchase um, a Harry Potter escape room kit or did you write your own? We're actually in the process of writing our own. It'll be our first time running it here. And we are using some ideas that we found online from other libraries. Um, we do follow a couple pages on, on social media um, that have given us other ideas, but all the librarians who um, run this program are working together to write the clues. And we're trying to make it so that the guests who participate don't have to have prior Harry Potter experience or knowledge either, so that we can include everyone. Great, thank you. And I believe um, there are some, um, oh, thank you, Jillian beat me to it. Um, <laughs> there's online um, ideas. And so Jillian posted a link in the chat box uh, to that, to a specific Harry Potter one as well. So thank you everyone. So in the chat box, if you guys um, have any questions or follow up or um, even fun ideas of your own, please feel free to chat to everyone in the chat box. We're going to switch gears here. Um, I, I might have forgotten to mention at the top of our webinar um, that the Collaborative Summer Library Program is brought to libraries across Michigan thanks to the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And also thanks to the IMLS, we have grants available from the Library of Michigan. So you heard some really, really cool ideas today. Um, some, most of them require very little um, in terms of resources, but if you want to take it up a step, we do have the Public Library Services Grant. Karen Reich has been posting on MichLibL. I've been forwarding those messages to the My Youth Listserv. Um, and the Public Library Services Grant is for $500 to $2,000 a year for a summer program. So if you want to step up some of your technology or materials um, for early literacy kits, or perhaps uh, with your teens you want to do a special program that requires some more resources, make sure you take a look at that grant. Um, and then, of course, whatever you acquire through that grant, you use in the summer, you turn in a very simple report to Karen Reich, um, our LSTA coordinator here at the Library of Michigan, and um, you have it at your library thereafter as well. So don't just think summer, you know, implement it in the summer for the grant, but then you can keep it throughout the year. Um, and you can take a look at all the grants available at michigan.gov slash LSTA. Um, oh, Jocelyn in the chat says Loin Township won a grant in 2019. It was super easy to follow. Yes. Um, it is a one pager. If you apply for the Collaborative Services Grant or the Improving Access to Information Grant, those are definitely more complicated um, and detailed. Um, they're so worthwhile. So I'm very excited to offer this, these grants to you and they are out now. Um, any questions for us? Here's a list of all of our presenters today. I really appreciate the Youth Services Advisory Council um, for being willing to put on this webinar every year because otherwise you would all have to sit here and listen to me yammer on. So <laughs> I appreciate you being here. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat box. But if, like I said, if you haven't accessed the online manual, um, please do contact me. My email is up here on the screen, lancasterc5 at michigan.gov. And I'm not seeing any questions. So with that, I'm going to stop our, our recording. And I hope you all have a happy 2020 and enjoy planning for summer reading. <laughs>